Good morning, friends. Welcome back to Acre Homestead. Today, we are going to be doing a couple fun things, local food related things. Uh, first thing we're going to do is I'm going to go pick up my sister-in-law and I are going to go peach picking because peaches are in season and we've got some good fun preservation projects we want to do with some fresh local peaches. And then we are going to go pick up our half of a cow. So I buy 99% of all my beef and pork from local ranchers. And today is the day to go pick up the half a steer that I've put a deposit or I've already paid for. And I'll kind of walk you along that process of what that's like. To pick up half a cow, I need containers to put the meat in. The butcher that I use does not provide containers. Some butchers do. So the way I like to, or what I like to bring in order to do that are these. Let me show you. So I like to bring these reusable bags because the meat can be super heavy. I like to try to organize it in like stuff and then I can just throw these in the freezer. And this is a way I can organize my beef in a deep freeze because I don't have a stand-up freezer. I also brought this laundry basket because it has handles and I only have one box. So hopefully with all the bags, the box, laundry basket will have enough to fit all the beef. I do like to bring gloves because you're handling a lot of frozen beef and so your fingers can get cold. So I'm gonna bring those and we're gonna head. Would really like to get my car washed. I have not washed it once this summer because of how busy we've been together. And I think that it would be, I have a little coupon actually to get a car wash. I didn't really want to wash it or clean it out while we were in the midst of all the packing and bringing stuff up and down because this car basically became like a, a closet on wheels or a truck on wheels and I just stuff stuff in here. So it'd be nice to clean a few things. And then I'm still on my driveway, just so you know, so I'm, I'm safe driving here. I also, the peach farm that we're going to, it is next to where I buy my pork from and they have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful farm stand. So I think it'd be also really, really fun if we can go to the farm stand. I am driving out of my driveway, so I'll see you guys when we pick up my sister-in-law. We got Lacey and the baby and now we are on our way. We're almost there. The farm we are going to is called Glosson Farms and it is in Hillsboro, Oregon. It's about an hour or so-ish from our house. It is out of the Portland, Oregon metro area, and it is right next door to Roloff Farms. So if you've ever watched Little People Big World, Roloff Farms is their pumpkin patch. I have never even been to Roloff Farms before, which is kind of funny because I grew up in this area. But we really like the Glosson Farm Peach Farm. We've been here, this is our second year in a row, and we were really glad that they had bright peaches on this day. The way it works is they tell you when they have ripe peaches and that's when you get to go peach picking. They give you the box. They don't like you to bring your own boxes. They have a small box and a large box. I'm gonna fill the large box and Lacey's gonna fill the small box. And we are excited to get some locally grown peaches today. So the variety we're picking today is Canadian Harmony, which is a free stone, meaning it'll be good to can. Large yellow peach commonly used for desserts, jams, fresh eating. Got our basket. Okay, yeah, here's some peaches. Those are beautiful. Is it softer? No. No. <laughs> no. They're pretty. They're very pretty. Let's take a look. Oh, this one. Oh, that's rock hard. Yeah. This one's a little softer. Oh yeah. Well, that's good. That means I won't have to deal with them right away. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're definitely still pretty firm. Peaches will definitely ripen off the tree. And last year we came, they were so perfectly ripe. I ate probably four of them in the field, but it meant that as soon as I got home, they had to be dealt with or they were gonna go bad. So this actually might be a little bit nicer because it'll give me time to deal with them when I have time versus having to do it right away. Mm. You good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it tastes good. Mm. So one nice thing is that they're not so ripe this year that they're, we're damaging when we're picking them. 
Last year when we would take them off the tree, we were poking holes in the fruit. And this year, I think they're actually perfect for picking. And you're supposed to kind of twist. Now that we have our peaches, it is time to check out. The way that you pay for these peaches is per pound, so we have to weigh them. They also sell peach cider, which I have never tried before. Cider is probably my favorite, and not that I can enjoy these today or tomorrow, but come this winter, peach cider sounds delicious, and they don't sell this in the grocery store. So I thought, you know what, I think I'm gonna pick these up as well and we're excited to give those a try this winter when it's cold outside. So we got a total of 25 pounds, and now we are gonna head to Halvation Market, which is the farm where I buy my pork from. I came here last summer and did a tour where I took you guys along this farm. They grow beef, pork, turkeys, and chickens, all pasture-raised, grass-fed, grass-finished, and they have a little greenhouse outside, and they're selling fall crop starts which is amazing it is so hard to find stores that sell fall crops as starts and not have to do it yourself if i was going to have my garden through this whole fall i would have picked some up but we aren't going to be able to do that so they got to hang here at the nursery but that is cool they have this really really beautiful farmers market it's open all year round and they have fresh chicken. So they process all their chicken at the farm and you can buy it fresh, not just frozen, which is pretty rare experience. And they have this beautiful coffee shop in their farmer's market as well. And it was getting pretty toasty outside. So Lacey and I both enjoyed a lemonade. I got an Arnold Palmer and she got a lemonade and we sat out and watched the cows. This is where they grow all of their meat out here and it's just a beautiful beautiful setting at this farm you can put a deposit down and purchase a whole half or hog whole half or quarter beef but they also sell in their market already butchered and broke down pieces so you can try the different cuts or try the meat out first before you decide to go ahead and put a deposit down on a whole or half of a pork or beef which I think is a really cool option or if you just don't have the freezer space their goal at this market is to try to have everything that you would need at a store in order to feed your family so they also have locally grown produce that is just stunning and they also have locally made handcrafted goods now that we enjoyed the market we are gonna head home and I'm gonna drop Lacey off and the boys, and I am gonna to head to Battleground, Washington, so on the whole other direction of town in order to pick up our half a beef. We're back on our side of town, and I'm gonna go run, and I've gotta go pick up a check from the bank because I forgot to grab one when I was at my house. This butcher only takes checks or cash, and so I need to go pick up a check. Now that we are on our way to the butcher shop, I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about the process of buying beef from a local farmer. So what you need to do first is you need to find a farmer. The best way to find a farmer is Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, a website called localharvest.org, um, ask people in your area and or Google local butcheries, butchers in your area and talk to them and ask them which ones they would recommend. Then once you find your farmer, you get to talk to them and figure out their farming practices. And there's a couple things that are really important to me when I buy my beef. I've been buying my beef actually from the same guy for almost eight years now. And I used to buy a quarter of a beef about once 
it was about once a year, give or take. Sometimes it would be a little less, sometimes it would be a little bit more. And now I did buy half of a beef and that usually lasts about two years. When you find your farmer and you're asking them questions about how they raise their cattle, you can ask them what they're feeding their cattle. Something that's important to me is grass fed and grass finished. A lot of farmers and ranchers will start their cows on grass and then before they go to butcher, they will feed them grains in order to bulk them up and beef them up before going to butcher so that you can they can grow them out faster and you get more marbling typically when you feed them in grain and it kind of sweetens the meat a little bit. But that does change the fatty acid ratio, the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. And I prefer the ratio because it is a healthier ratio in grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And I prefer the flavor. It's what beef is supposed to taste like. Cows were designed to eat grass. They're not technically designed to eat grains. It does change the biochemistry in their, not only the meat, but in their stomach. And they're not as healthy typically of an animal when they're eating grains. Now that is totally a personal preference and a personal choice, something that you get to decide when you are talking to your farmers and you can have that control of making that choice. When you go to the grocery store to buy grass-fed beef, there is no regulations on what that means. And so a cow could eat grass for one day and they could call it grass-fed beef and they could put a premium price on it. So when you are talking to your local farmers, you then have a lot of control on what you're actually purchasing. Another reason why I like grass-fed beef is because I'm buying from a local farmer. He feeds all of his steers and cows on grass on his own ranch. He doesn't have to bring any inputs in in order to feed them. Typically, the ranchers who feed their cows grains aren't the farmers that are growing the grain. So they then have to import that grain from somewhere else. And most of the grain that is grown in the U.S. is grown in the Midwest. So a lot of times that grain can be trucked all across the country in order to get to the cow and feed that cow. So it just reduces a little bit of carbon emissions, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it, but it just makes it a little bit more of a greener product, I guess. I guess that's probably not the best word. And like I said, it's there's nothing, I, I don't think there's a moral wrong or right choice, but for me, the right choice is grass-fed, grass-finished, and I like to buy it from a local farmer. So once you've figured all that out and you figure out what's important to you, you then put typically a deposit down on a cow. You can usually do quarter, half, or whole, and you're not getting like the back half or the front half of the cow because there's different cuts of meat depending on the back half and the front half. They do it side by side. And if you order a quarter of a cow, you're not getting the back quarter or the front quarter. You're going to get a half of a half. So you're going to get half from the back end and half from the front end. So once you found your farmer, you put your deposit down, and then typically there's a waiting period while the cow grows. And then it goes to butcher. And there typically is a butcher fee. Once they've butchered the cow, they skin it, they gut it, and they hang it. And then you pay per pound on the hanging weight. Once you then pay the rancher for the hanging weight, then that will go to the butcher and they process it. And then you have to pay the butcher to process your meat. So you pay the rancher and the butcher two separate because they're doing two different jobs for you. The rancher is growing the beef, the butcher is processing the beef. And that's where we are now. We are at the butcher shop. I gave them cutting instructions. We can talk all about that later but you give them how you want it processed and then you come and pick it up. So it is frozen, I'm here, and it's time to pick up our half a beef. We got it all packed up. I think now I sh I'm gonna run home because we, we have half of a beef that's frozen. I don't think I'm gonna take the time to go through the car wash. We're home. I'm gonna get all of this meat out. I'm gonna lay it out and I'm gonna show you everything we got. And I can't talk about pricing. Pricing is going to depend on a few things. It's going to depend on whether you decide to do grass-fed, grass-finished. That's always a little bit more expensive. And it's going to depend on where you live in the country as well. But I will tell you exactly what I paid for everything. I just pulled out the liver. My dogs are going to be super, super happy with me for that. So as I bring stuff in, because I didn't have enough bags, I'm going to empty them, sort them with like things with like things, 
I need to go get my gloves because my hands are cold. Here we have it all laid out. I'm gonna go over what everything is. I wanna talk about what I paid for all this meat real fast before we get into what exactly everything is. Going back to what I was talking about earlier, I pay my rancher a price per pound for hanging weight. So once the animal is butchered, then they skin it, they gut it, and they hang it. And I paid $4.50 for hanging weight. My steer for half of it was 386 pounds. I paid a $500 deposit. So minus my $500, my remaining balance was $1,237 because that deposit goes towards the actual final price. So what I paid total to the rancher was $1,737. And I just looked on my local rancher's website and he just raised his price for hanging weight 15 cents per pound, which still is very low compared to what you would, what inflation has happened in grocery stores. But because I purchased, I put my deposit down on this, I think six months ago, I locked in that price. I won't need to buy beef in any sort of quantity for probably two years for Josh and I. So I now have locked in that price. And that's one reason why I like to buy beef in bulk and pork in bulk because I can try to inflation proof my pantry. Once I pay the balance due to my rancher, he then gives the A-OK -okay to the butcher to call me and get my cutting instructions because once it's butchered, they hang it and dry age it for two to three weeks. That just helps tenderize it, intensifies the flavor, and it's just really, really good. Dry aged versus wet aged is a whole other conversation in and of itself, but the way that my butcher does it is dry aged. So now that I've paid the rancher, I need to pay the butcher. I paid 90 cents per pound to have this butchered, plus the kill fee, which was $65. That has gone up $15 since I think last time I bought a half a cow two years ago. I think I paid $50 last time. So total to the rancher, I think I spent $419 today. I just wrote that check, you know, three hours ago, and I don't even remember the exact price. So between paying the butcher and the rancher, I paid about $2,100 for this beef. And that comes out to being roughly about $5.10 a pound for what is sitting on my counter right here. Organic beef at Costco in my local grocery store is $5.65 a pound, and that's just for ground beef. I have all the specialty cuts in here. If I was to buy grass-fed, grass-finished prime rib or beef tenderloin roast, I'm gonna be paying anywhere from 45 to $60 a pound. So that's the one thing is, it, this is a huge upfront cost, huge. But you're locking in your price and you're paying the same price for ground beef that you're paying for filet mignon. So it all, it just, it ends up being way more affordable to do it this way. So let's get right into it and I'm gonna show you what exactly we have here for a little over $2,100. I'm gonna start right here. These are things that most people do not request. I've got liver, heart, kidney, tongue, and tallow. This is really beautiful fat that is from around the kidneys. This is called leaf tallow. And this is the cleanest fat. You can see how beautifully white it is. This makes wonderful soap, and this is what you can use for cooking. McDonald's used to cook all their french fries in tallow, but then they wanted vegetarians to be able to eat their french fries, so now they cook it in vegetable oil, and they put artificial tallow flavor in their oil so that it still tastes like tallow. Tallow is a really, really healthy fat, especially if you're having grass-fed, grass-finished, because there's a lot of vitamin D in it. And just really healthy. Now the thing about when you get the organ meats, you're actually dropping your price per pound because there's only one heart, one set of kidneys, one liver, and one tongue, one set of leaf lard per cow. 
I requested it, the person that bought the other half of the cow did not request it. If neither of us request it, it goes in the garbage. It's a complete waste. I am going to find uses for these. Many people eat them. Josh and I just don't prefer to eat them, but my dogs love them. I'm actually going to put these organ meats to thaw and I'm gonna get them in my freeze dryer and I'm gonna freeze dry them up so that my dogs can enjoy them. So this is a great way to reduce that price per pound because you're getting things that normally would just be tossed. My goal is to respect the animal. You know, maybe we will make a uh, pickled beef tongue as an experiment. I've heard from you all that it's delicious. I'm just scared. So give me the encouragement I need to make this because it would be a good experiment. But the rest of these organ meats are gonna be for the dogs. This is gonna be soap and for cooking. We have one prime rib roast. This is probably gonna be for Christmas. I supply, if you've watched cooking with my mom, a lot of the meats for Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and stuff because I like to be able to supply the high quality stuff. So remember, at the holidays, this is about $35 a pound for conventional raised beef. And I just paid a little over $5 a pound for this prime rib roast. Here is a tenderloin roast, or this could turn into your filet mignon. If I cut this into steaks, it would be filet mignon. But I like to make beef wellington. We made that together um, this over this last holiday, and it was delicious. So I want to be able to make that again. So that's what that is. I have a brisket here. You can request your butcher to cut this in half. We usually have brisket for my birthday, not this year because I hadn't picked up my beef yet, but we'll find a nice party to serve this brisket. That's why I like to have it whole so it's the size for a party. And here's an example where you get to make a choice as the customer. The T-bone steak would be typically where you have the filet mignon and the New York together with a T-bone that runs right through the middle. But you can't have a T-bone steak and a tenderloin roast and a New York separate. You have to make that choice. I choose to have this be one long roast and for my New York steaks to be separate. Another thing you can request your butcher to do is package these up in four steaks or two steaks. I like two. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six packages of two steaks each of New York steaks. So that's gonna make a really yummy dinner for Josh and I. We also got flank steak. If you watched where we just did a birthday party at my mom's house, I really like flank steak. I never ever buy it. And it was my birthday, I hadn't picked up my half a beef yet, so she asked me what I wanted and I thought, you know, let's get flank steak. The reason why it's so special is you only get one flank steak per beef. And so I request that flank steak and so we're gonna enjoy that at some point. Another specialty item that I like to get that normally, if you don't request it, your butcher is going to turn it into ground beef, and that is the skirt steak. The skirt steak makes delicious street tacos, so I request those. What typically happens is when you go to put your order in with the butcher with what you want, they give you a generic cutting sheet. The more you research and know, the more specialty type items you can ask for. Like skirt steak, I've never seen it on a cutting sheet, but they will be happy to do it for you. And so I ask for it and they're, they're willing to do it for me. So just doing that little bit more research than just that cutting sheet will give you a lot more options on what different cuts of meat you can get. From the skirt steak, we got oxtail and I'll probably just make bone broth out of this. We got two, four packages of soup bones. And then in here we have one big bag of dog bones. I can turn this into bone broth bones if I want, but these are probably gonna end up being for the pupperoos and they're gonna really enjoy that. And what I needed the most was ground beef. I have 124 pounds of ground beef and I requested them to be in one pound packages. Butchers will often ask, do you want your ground beef in one, one and a half or two pound packages? I've always asked for one pound packages, except for last time I asked for one and a half pounds. Wasn't as happy with one and a half pounds because if I wanted to pull two out, then I had three pounds, not two pounds. Long story short, 
it worked, it's fine, but this time I went back to my trusty one pounds. One thing I love about this butcher, because I've used a couple different ones and I will always go back to this butcher, is they package their ground beef in these square blocks as opposed to those long tubes. I can fit this in the bottom of my freezer in a cardboard box so much more efficiently because of how well it stacks together than I can in those tubes. So just for this reason alone, well, not just for this reason, but this is one of the main reasons why I love this butcher because I love these square packages. Now, one thing my butcher doesn't do, and it makes me sad, is they do not make hamburger patties. What I have done for hamburger patties for grass-fed, grass-finished beef, because I don't like making hamburger patties. Can I make hamburger patties? Absolutely, I can make hamburger patties. But what I've done, and you've seen me do this before, is I buy from ButcherBox grass-fed, grass-finished, patties because they are committed to grass-fed grass-finished you can't always trust that label when you see it at the grocery store and i trust butcher box so i purchase my hamburger patties from butcher box and then most of my chicken from butcher box and so if you're interested in butcher box i can leave a link down in the description i do have a discount slash promotion that's going on that is down there this video is not sponsored by butcher box but i'm just being honest with you what i do because i don't like making hamburger patties. In the case that I d am not able to order butcher box, I can make hamburger patties. If you've never had grass fed, grass finished beef, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to try butcher box and try the flavor of grass fed, grass finished beef because it does taste different than grain finished. Animals taste like what they eat and if an animal is eating a lot of corn and grains, it's gonna taste different than if they're eating grass. Some people, I love the flavor. It's what beef is intended to taste like. Some people don't. And so um, if you're interested in getting into grass-fed, grass-finished beef, that might be a good option for you to get your feet wet, see if you like it before you invest $2,100 into it. Now this is something new to me that I have never requested before. And this is a rump roast. I normally have all my rump roasts turned into ground beef because I prefer chuck roasts. So I have 13 chuck roasts here and they're about four-ish pounds each. I like the texture of the way chuck roast breaks down better. For Josh and I, 13 roasts is more than enough to get us through two years because that's one roast every other month. And that's about how much roast we eat. We don't go through a lot of roast. But I wanted to try making my own roast beef. And if I, know, if I remember correctly, you use a rump roast to make roast beef. You roast it up, you cut it thin, and then it's ready for sandwiches. So that's why I bought that because, or had them cut it with just one because I wanted to try that. Normally, you, if you didn't have all of that turned into ground beef, you would have about this much rump roast in rump roast. But like I said, I needed more ground beef to fill my freezer. Now what I need to do is go put this all in my freezer. I hope this was helpful and it kind of demystifies some of the process. I didn't go in depth on the different cuts you can get when it comes to ordering half or quarter of a beef. And that is pretty in depth because there's so many different options you can do and when i first started buying beef in bulk there was hardly anything online about it and there is now a youtube channel called the bearded butchers and i'm going to link their video down in the description box because i wish there was a resource like that when i first started because it took me a long time to learn about the different cuts and where the cuts come from and what they're good for and why I might want certain cuts and why I might not want certain cuts of the different options. And so I'm gonna link their video down below because they do a great job breaking that down for you. And there is a lot of pressure when you're buying bulk beef like this because this is quite an investment and you wanna make sure that you're getting the cuts that you and your family enjoy eating. My number one recommendation when it comes to buying half whole beef or hog is to look at what you purchase at the grocery store, what are the cuts you enjoy, and those are the cuts you should be requesting from your butcher. 
For example, when I first started buying pork from local ranchers, I would get all these fancy different cuts of pork and they were things that I just never purchased. I didn't know how to cook with them and they ended up sitting in my freezer for way too long. So now when I buy pork, I mostly just request bacon, ground Italian sausage, ground breakfast sausage, and maybe a couple hams and some pork chops. And that's about it because that's what I buy at the grocery store. I tend to use sausage and that's, and bacon. And so there's nothing, there's no right or wrong when it comes to knowing what cuts you and your family enjoy. It's just knowing what you enjoy and then requesting those cuts to be what your butcher process is for you. I finally got all of that meat in the freezer. That took a little bit of rearranging when we moved and I packed everything in the freezer. I did not organize it as well as I should have. So I took a few minutes to try to get it organized. It's not as good as it's going to be. We are going to invest in a stand-up freezer. I wanna put all my freezer meals in one freezer. I wanna put all my pork and beef in one freezer and I want all my fruits and veggies in another freezer. And so, I did try to organize it as best I can between the two for now, but knowing that I'm gonna hopefully at some point get another freezer, I didn't do a perfect job. But I didn't wanna put all these soup bones in the freezer to have them get buried and then fish them out or whatever. I thought, let's just go ahead and make bone broth right now. So I have all my bones in here. I found some carrots in the fridge. I only have four onions from the garden, so we're gonna put those in, but I wanna give everything a good wash. I'm not gonna cut them up any smaller than that. I'm just gonna throw those carrots in their hole. These were from the garden, so they definitely need to be rinsed off. They have actual dirt on them. Real food comes dirty. I'm gonna make a simple, simple broth. You can brown your bones first if you want for a richer flavor. I don't have the energy for that tonight, so we're not gonna do that. I'm gonna have this go for at least 24 hours. Broth is probably one of my absolute favorite things to preserve. The bang for your buck you get with it is incredible. You basically take scraps, bones, chicken bones, pork bones, beef bones, whatever it might be, and you turn them into a value added product. And if I was at my other house, I haven't moved out the contents of my inside refrigerator, which has carrot peels, scraps, onion peels, scraps, which is what I normally make my broth with. I don't have that here right now, so we're just using carrots and onions. And you turn it into something that is worth an actual dollar amount. <laughs> to buy real bone broth in the grocery store, you're talking five, six, seven, eight, sometimes ten dollars a quart. It's crazy. And the cheap broth, is mostly just artificial flavorings and water with a little bit of chicken. And so for pennies, basically the cost of a canning lid, you can have broth. This is gonna be a very, very simple broth. I have water, salt, pepper, bones, carrots, maybe a bay leaf or two. Some people don't even salt their broth until they go to use it. I like to salt my broth. I think it's just good to kind of salt every layer. And I don't think I'm gonna put any garlic in it. I think that's it. I'm gonna put the lid on this and I'm gonna put it at 350 degrees until it comes up to a boil and then I'll reduce it down to a simmer. And this is gonna go for at least 24 hours. The next project we're gonna get going once it thaws a little bit more is I'm gonna get the freeze dryer going with some of the liver and heart because I don't wanna put those in my freezer to then get out to thaw later. We're just gonna do it right now. But before we do any of that, I want to sanitize my island. All of those packages were wrapped, but before I do any other cooking, well, I guess I'm gonna be cutting up liver here in a minute once it thaws a little bit more for me to handle, but I wanna make sure I have a clean surface 
to work with. I did go ahead and put those peaches in the refrigerator because I definitely do not have the energy to peel peaches and can peaches tonight. We probably won't get to that for two or three days. One of the reasons I am totally okay they were not as ripe as they were last year. They still were really good. Oh my goodness. I think my organ meat is thawed enough for me to use it. I have gloves on. Honestly, working with liver is not my favorite thing to do, but I think it's important to try to use every part of the animal as much as possible. So I have my four freeze dryer trays out here. I just rinsed them off because I just freeze dried some garden fresh zucchini and cucumbers. And then I have a tray over here with some parchment. I think that this is gonna be too much for one batch in the freeze dryer. So I'm gonna put the extra on there and flash freeze it in individual pieces so that as soon as the first batch is done, I can go ahead, take the frozen ones and put them on here and run my freeze dryer for a second time. We got four full trays plus I have this that I'm going to cut up and now put on that tray but for now we're going to get these on the freeze dryer. I have freeze dried liver one other time and it didn't take super long time to freeze dry so I think tomorrow probably 18 ish or so hours this will be done it's gonna go a lot faster because the liver is probably 90% still frozen which it which is awesome that makes it so that the freeze dryer doesn't have to do as much work the way a freeze dryer works is it actually freezes food and then it freeze dries it that's why you can work from either a frozen state or a fresh state. And if you work from a frozen state, you're just saving your freeze dryer that step. So I'm gonna get this taken care of, chopped up, put in the freezer so we can get another batch going as soon as that's done. I hope you found value out of this video. If you did, you're, you're welcome to share it with anybody who might be interested in getting into buying local, buying food from local ranchers and local farmers. Yes, I live on a homestead. I have acreage, I could grow my own cows out if I wanted to, but that's just not something that Josh and I right now realistically have the time or desire to do. But I am more than willing and more than happy to partner with local food producers in my area and get that food security in my freezer that way. All of our homesteads can look different. We all only have so much time in the day and we all can only focus on certain things. My goal is to try to grow as much produce as possible and so we are wrapping up this garden season and then we're gonna be diving next year into building out a big garden here. So producing meat is just not something that we're in the market to do right now, but by creating these relationships with these people that are local food producers in our area, we can create food security, food community. What does Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead say? She says, not self-sufficient, but community sufficient. And that was one thing when 2020 and all the craziness started, a lot of the local food producers would only work with the customers they had already had established first before they would bring in new customers. So it's always smart to start building those relationships and, and just creating some food security. It's a win-win relationship. I am helping you know, pay their bills by me partnering with them and they're helping fill my freezer. We need each other in order for this to work because obviously John, the man who is raising up this beef, him and his family could not eat all of the beef he raises. So he needs to find a way to share that. And I'm more than willing to be the person to take that off his hands. And I just love that every time I open up a can of peaches or I cook a beautiful meal for my friends or my family, I know where that food came from. If it didn't come from my backyard, I know the face of the person who produced it. 
I know where it was grown and it's just a beautiful story behind the meal that we eat. So anyway, that was long winded. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. If you enjoyed this video, I'd greatly appreciate a thumbs up. I can pop some more videos right here if you're interested. I can actually do a whole tutorial on how to can broth start to finish. I'll put that right here and I'll put another video down here. You can go enjoy between now and my next upload. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye friend.